If scientists accidentally fixed global warming by creating a new global ice age and forcing the remnants of humanity to stay on a circumnavigational train, would you know how to survive? In this video, I'm going to be teaching you how to beat the death train from the Snowpiercer. Now to understand what I mean by the death train and how the last bastion of humanity could be so shit and scary, let's take a look. It's a train that travels around the globe 360 days a year, so what could be so bad about it? Everyone's there together. It's a technically self-sustaining train that protects you from the cold. There's certain carts that are designed for different purposes. For example, there's a cart that produces sushi and fish, another cart that produces uh, food and it's a garden cart, and there's even a nail salon cart where the Karens could go get their fucking hair cut. However, there's uh, one especially shit cart that most people in the movie live to. It's a crowded back cart, which is full of poor people. And I refer to it as the concentration camp cart. The worst part is, is if you're born to a certain cart, you're staying there the rest of your life. You can't leave the fucking cart. The whole premise of the movie and why this movie needs to even be beat in general and why you couldn't just stay in your train cart is that the people in the back of the train cart end up revolting and they're trying to make their way to the front of the train cart. So let's get started on how we could beat individual scenes of the movie. To start off with the movie, we see a bunch of cops, which are the people that travel around the train cart enforcing law and making sure that no one is revolting. The cops are basically taking role by getting rows of people to sit down. However, there's one guy, fucking Captain America, no just kidding, that's actually Curtis in this movie. His name is Curtis and he's the leader of the rebellion. However, I find it really stupid that he's the only one standing up. As a leader, you definitely don't want to draw attention to yourself, because if people know that you're the leader, they're gonna start watching you closely and any rebellion will fail. I know it's really hard for white male lead actors to do, but definitely fucking blend in. Because like I said earlier, the last thing you want is the leader of the rebellion to be spotted out and taken out instantly, because then there's no fucking rebellion. After taking role, the police officers start distributing food to all the people. They don't get traditional food, instead they get these things known as protein blocks, which look like disgusting fucking blobs of jello that apparently have lots of protein that they can sustain off of, and this is the only food that they get. Although this may seem gross to people who first experience it, I strongly suggest eating as much as you can. Especially during a rebellion, there might not be enough food, so you want to stay strong at all times. Curtis never actually eats many protein blocks in the movie because inside some of the blocks, there are messages from the front of the train teaching people in the back what to do during the revolt. Honestly, I find this extremely sus, and I would suspect it's something used to find people who are traitorous and then kill them before a revolt can start. You know when the teacher's like, I'm gonna close my eyes, and whoever stole the gel pen, bring it to the front and no one gets in trouble? Sort of like that, because you get in trouble anyways after you bring it up. However, before people can analyze the message and start the revolt, this creepy lady wearing yellow clothes starts measuring and taking kids away from the families in the back of the train. There's this one black lady that attempts to save her kid who's small enough to get taken away by hiding him under her dress. However, the one thing she did wrong is standing at the front of the crowd. I don't understand why she couldn't just stand in the back with the kid hidden under her dress. That way no one would even look. After the kids get taken away, one parent tries to take his kid back by fighting with his shoe. As a result, they take his hand outside the train and freeze it off. Well, that certainly isn't good for the rebellion because that definitely kills some morale since some people don't want to get their arms frozen and chopped off. Luckily for the characters in the movie, the rebellion continues anyways. What they try to do is get a series of barrels linked together and plug it through the series of doors, preventing them from closing and allowing them to access the other train carts. I actually think this is quite an intelligent way of making sure the doors never close. However, what I think they could have done is instead of using people to lift all the barrels, they could have created some wheels using smaller barrels to make the movement of this barrel chain much faster, preventing time from closing the door. And the only reason any of this works is because Curtis suspects that none of them actually have any bullets, because one person said that their guns were useless. However, this is a very bad way to test a theory. Curtis literally runs up to guard and holds the gun to his head. What if there was a bullet? He'd literally be fucking dead. Instead, a much better option is to get a meat shield and get someone that's much less important than you to do your job for you. Or you could even choose to not do it at all and just pray they don't have bullets, because at least that time you'll have the element of surprise and they won't be ready to shoot you. After fighting their way through a bunch of cops, including this big motherfucker, they're able to make it to the prison cart, where they rescue the engineer of the train as well as his daughter. They need this guy because they need to open the doors to the other carts in order to continue the rebellion. The engineer is extremely addicted to drugs, so they use that to incentivize him to open doors. The group then moves from the prison cart to the food production cart, which is the cart responsible for creating food for the people in the back of the train. And we quickly realize how disturbing it is and what their protein blocks are actually made of. 
Yeah, honestly, I'd have the same reaction as you, Curtis, if that was what the protein blocks were made out of. After having an argument with the person making the protein blocks, Curtis finds another one of the special messages. This time, it says water. Obviously, if I were in this situation, I would believe it's a trap, because why would someone at the front of the train randomly try to help the people in the back? They've never spoken, so it really doesn't make any sense. Well, since they've already started the revolt, they technically have nothing to do, so they might as well go on the only clue they have. So they decide that they need to head to the water supply cart to control the water of the entire train. However, once they reach the water supply cart, they open the door, and it's heavily fucking guarded. I don't know what these people are even designed to do on the train, and why they're just standing in the water supply cart, but the people in the back of the train were definitely outmatched in this one. They only have bats and crowbars. The enemy team has blades and has armor. It's not to mention this creepy annoying bitch is back with her two secret service bodyguard looking motherfuckers, so this is gonna look like a tough battle. The two groups immediately start clashing, and things look really cool because Curtis is able to beat a lot of people despite being out of weapons and human disadvantage. However, there's a few things he could have done to make the fighting look a lot more smooth. In blade to blade combat, the shield is one of the most effective weapons. It can be used to block strikes, and it can also prevent other people from striking your friends from behind since they can't run past a shield. So Curtis should have taken apart some scrap metal back from the barrel earlier and created a shield for some people in the front. That way they can fight similar to Roman Legion where some people block the shields and other people attack with sticks and long swords from behind those shields. However, in the middle of the fight, everything just stops. Everyone stops fighting. Why? Because the train conductor announces that the train is snow piercing or running through snow that is on the rail of the train. And it just so happens to also be New Year's and these creepy dudes start fucking chanting. What I don't understand is why can't you kill them while they're chanting or while they're sitting next to you while the train is shaking? Just because the train is shaking doesn't mean you can't move. The fighting resumes and the train enters a tunnel. However, this is a big disadvantage for our boys in the back because the soldiers have night vision goggles. Curtis and the crew are only saved by people in the back who are able to get torches and bring them up to the front, thus illuminating the area and allowing them to turn the fight. However, instead of using fire as just a light source, they could have easily used it as a weapon as well. A torch itself can be a weapon. They could have created Molotov cocktails, and the drugs Curtis was giving the engineer guy, remember that? Curtis says it could be like dynamite, and it could fucking explode, so they could have definitely used that as a grenade if they wanted to. The crew from the concentration camp car are able to capture the lady that does all the speeches and is the de facto leader, however, they end up losing their second in command, Edgar. The group only spare that lady because she says she can bring them to the front of the train. Personally, I think this is a great idea because that prevents you from losing more people from fighting. At first, they thought if they controlled the water supply of the train, then they'd be able to control the entire train and bargain. But this is not the case because the water supply comes from two ends, both the back and the front. So even if they take over one, they can just get water from the other. So they have to venture to the front of the train. What I don't understand is why they only bring a certain amount of people. Why not just bring everyone? The group then moved to the next car, which is a garden car. Nothing really happens here except the group starts realizing all the luxuries that they never had back in their own car. To be fair, you have been fighting for a really long time and you need those calories. There's nothing stopping you from grabbing one or two oranges off the trees and eating, because you never know when you might need the strength to fight again. The next cart they enter is the aquarium cart. Nothing really noteworthy happens here either. They just walk through the cart, see all the cool fish, and they end up getting some sushi, which is served twice a year. This just shows the difference between the front of the train and the back of the train, and how the people in the back of the train are definitely treated like shit. However, they really told the lady from the front to eat shit because they made her eat a protein block instead of the sushi. This scene here low-key seems a little bit like a scene from the movie A Day After Tomorrow. I have a video on that on my channel and you should definitely go watch it. It's pretty interesting. Anyways, back to the movie. After having a delicious meal of sushi, the group finally reach the classroom section where all the kids are being indoctrinated with Wilford era fucking propaganda. Wilford has a massive fucking cock. And here we see this nice bald man delivering New Year eggs to everybody in the train. He goes from front to back and is giving one egg to each person, except for those in the tail end, of course. The first and most obvious rule is to never let anyone into your vulnerable back lines if you don't know who they are. I know he looks nice and eggs look appealing, but there's no reason you should be letting him behind you, especially if you have all the weapons and fighters in the front. Now Curtis and the crew have a big fucking problem. There's people behind them with machine guns trying to kill them, and there's a teacher in the classroom with them with a the machine gun to kill them. Okay, never mind, the teacher actually died really fast because she can't aim her fucking gun. However, she can control the recoil pretty well. I don't really know what you can do in this situation if you're in the back of the car trapped with the rest of the people with machine guns, but I definitely try running because they're not gonna kill everyone because they need some people in the back. So if you stay in the back, maybe they'll stop killing people. 
Also, if I were part of the concentration camp car, I would definitely not be taking prisoners. They grant you literally no benefit because if you end up getting caught and they get freed, they go free and you're dead. So just kill them with you anyways. We'd see that the enemy military definitely has a uniform, so there's nothing stopping you from potentially stealing that uniform, preventing you from getting shot and allowing you to blend in with the enemy. Now Curtis and his crew attempt to push to the front of the car while they're being pursued by a secret agent coming from the back who picked up a machine gun. What I can say is this is definitely the right choice because going back and fighting would just be going back and dying because even if you kill them, they're eventually going to bring more troops and bring you down anyways. Eventually, the train starts going in a loop-de-loop -loop, so Curtis and the other guys start shooting at each other. However, they don't realize that the windows are fucking bulletproof and if you destroy the windows, the entire train is just going to explode. Killing everybody is not going to solve anything. Instead, I would just lie back and save my bullets for the final fight. Curtis and his group attempt to push forwards towards the front of the train. They go through a bunch of cards that they have never seen before, everything from lavish party cards to even dentists and everything in between. They end up starting to fight in the sauna. Curtis and the other dude are 1v2 against the secret agent guy. Everyone is disarmed, so they should fight at the same time. However, they do not do this. They instead fight one at a time. Everyone who's heard of the Battle of 300 should definitely know that if you have a numbers advantage, you should rush with all of them at the same time, not give them a chance to equalize the numbers advantage. One of Curtis's soldiers gets in the fight with the secret agent guy, however the secret agent guy has him pressed against a wall and is inserting a knife slowly into his chest. They're very close together, so there's nothing stopping the other dude from doing something other than slowly getting stabbed with a knife. What he could have done here is bite the other guy's nose or do something to release the grip. With the help of the black lady, Curtis is finally able to win the fight. Notice how they only won the fight after they ganged up on the dude? Why didn't they just do this earlier? The remaining three from Curtis's group, which are Curtis, the engineer, and the engineer's daughter, finally make their way to the very front of the train, where they're greeted by a strange boy that Curtis did not open. The Japanese dude has a genius idea of using all the drugs from earlier to create a bomb and then blowing a hole in the side of the train and escaping. My question is, is where the fuck are you escaping to? There's nothing outside other than frozen water, snow, and polar bears. It's basically when you're 12 years old and you're thinking about running away from home, but then you realize there's no Wi-Fi outside your house. Instead, what I would have done to force them to open the door is start killing everybody on the train. We know the train is not able to survive if everyone is there, so take out your weapons, your guns, your blades, and just start killing people from front to back until they open the gate and meet you. Luckily for the characters, they never have to actually do any of these extreme measures, because the yellow lady from earlier that looks like the guy from Curious George comes out and shoots the Japanese guy and then takes the grenade. Inside, the the leader of the train invites Curtis to become the new head of the train and inhabit the front of the train since he is getting old, so there needs to be a new operator. Honestly, if it were up to me and I was living like shit my entire life and he suddenly said that I'm allowed to become the head of the train, I would definitely take it, but Curtis doesn't take it. Curtis was actually about to take it, but instead he realizes that there's child slavery going on on the bottom of the train. Yeah, the train ran out of automated parts, so they replaced them with small children, which is why the children were being taken in the first place. Honestly, Curtis came really close to beating the entire movie. He made it to the front of the train like he wanted to. He almost took control of the entire train, just like what he wanted to. He could have made things fair. But instead, what does he do? He explodes the entire train by making the dynamite go off, and as a result, only two people out of the train survive, the engineer's daughter and one of the children's slaves. Is this a good outcome? Probably not. I know the train would only exist with the presence of child slavery, so Curtis didn't want to continue that, but he basically killed everyone, and in my opinion, slavery is a lot better than everyone dying. What I was thinking is instead of making a child slavery is you could make a child labor, have people volunteer their children up for extra rations or something like that. And if not, then you could maybe force everybody's children to work a certain amount of time rather than just a certain few children in slave-like conditions. All in all, that's it. I give this movie a beatability score of a 2 out of 10. It's very hard to beat because of the confined conditions as well as the very special circumstances that happen throughout the movie, as well as the fact you never have perfect information so you don't really know what's going on. If you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe and like button, it helps the channel a lot. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and peace.